Hello, welcome to the Center for Connected Health Policies Telehealth Policy Webinar Series, Federal Policy and Telehealth, What to Be Aware of Going Forward. My name is Mei Kwong. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Connected Health Policy. A few disclaimers and friendly reminders before we get started. Please note that any information provided in today's webinar is not to be considered legal advice. It is strictly for informational and educational purposes. CCHP always recommends that you consult with legal counsel if you're interested in a formal legal opinion. Additionally, if we happen to mention a company or show a picture of a product, know that neither CCHP or our speakers have any type of financial interest, arrangement, or affiliation with such an organization. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording and the slides will be made available a few days after the webinar on CCHP's website and also on CCHP's YouTube channel. Please note that closed captioning is available for today's webinar. If you go to your toolbar in Zoom, you'll see a closed caption option. We also ask that you please refrain from making any political statements or advertising commercial products or services in today's talk. If you have a question for our panelists, we ask that you use the Q&A function to ask your question. The chat function should only be used if you are having technical difficulties with Zoom. Once again, if you have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A function. If you have technical difficulties or a question about Zoom, please use the chat function. A bit of background about the Center for Connected Health Policy. CCHP was established in 2009 as a program underneath the Public Health Institute, primarily to be a California telehealth policy organization. An opportunity to become the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Resource Center became available in 2012 through a grant from HRSA. CCHP applied for that and we received the grant and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. We also work with a variety of other funders and partners on the federal and the state level on various telehealth and connected health projects. We act as the administrator of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, which I'll explain in more detail in a moment. And we also act as the convener for the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, which is a coalition made up of over 165 statewide and national groups who are interested in telehealth policy in the state of California. The National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers is made up of the 14 telehealth resource centers who are funded underneath the same program as CCHP. There are 12 regional resource centers that cover specific states, and there are two national centers. CCHP is the one on policy, and there's one that is focused on telehealth technologies that's located in Alaska. All 14 states decided several years ago to work more collaboratively and jointly together on projects that can span multiple regions. So we formed the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, and CCHP acts as the administration for that work, the administrator for that work. For today's webinar, we are going to look at uh, what will happen now that PHE has been renewed, the public health emergency has been renewed at least officially through January of 2023. But what happens after that if it's not up for another renewal or it lapses and expires? What are some of the questions that federal policymakers are asking as we face how we what decisions need to be made for permanent telehealth policies post PHE? And what are some of the information and data that's being provided to help those policymakers with their decisions? And what possible next steps could policymakers be contemplating taking in regards to telehealth policy on the federal level? I do wanna emphasize we are talking about federal issues, not state issues. So that is a different um, subject and they are all on different tracks. If you would like to know what is going on on the state level, I recommend you go to CCHP's website where we have our policy finder map that tracks all of the state policies, Medicaid policies, laws, and regulations related to telehealth. But just as an overview comment about state telehealth policy, they are all on different tracks and they are doing different things. So it is very specialized and specific to their state. But for the subject for today's webinar, we're talking about the federal level, mainly Medicaid or Medicare and the other additional policies that are within the federal jurisdiction and how congressional members may be making their decisions or what information they're relying on to help them with their decision making. 
Today's speakers, we have John Gordon, who's with the Office of Valuations and Inspections of the Office of the Inspector General. We also have Carly Patterson, who is the Associate Director, Healthcare Delivery and Disparities Research Program with the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Some of you may be more familiar with the acronym, it's PCORI. But before we begin, I'm going to give us an overview of what is going on with CMS and Medicare and controlled substance and prescribing. So this slide really provides you with a 100,000 level overview of what's going on or what changes were made in response to COVID-19 as far as telehealth is concerned. And we've broken it out between what happened on the state and what happened on the federal levels. And as you can see, there are some commonalities as far as what issues were addressed by these temporary telehealth policy changes in response to the pandemic. But then there are also certain issues that remain in the purview of a specific jurisdiction. So for example, HIPAA is something that the feds really had control over, but licensure is something that was in the jurisdictions of the states to dictate what would happen with it. But we do see some commonalities as far as like issue areas that needed to be addressed in order to help facilitate the use of telehealth in response to the pandemic. Now, as we look towards the public uh, federal public health emergency possibly ending January, we're wondering what's going to stick around, what's going to remain of these temporary changes, and we're going to go over that right now, and what to expect possibly in the wake of the end of the public health emergency. So on the federal level, you've got a couple of ways in which to make your policies permanent. You can either do it through a legislative route, or you can do it through an administrative route. The legislative route is Congress passes a bill, the president signs it, it becomes federal law. The administrative route is CMS or the administering agency decides that they're going to make a change to the policy and it will be carried out beyond the public health emergency or it will go into effect after the public health emergency is declared over. Now, on the federal level, a lot of the telehealth policy that we talk about is really related to Medicare. And at least on the Medicare side of things, there have been some changes that were made that we know will stick around or will exist or come into um, effect once the public health emergency is declared over. And they've done this by two, the two routes that I just described earlier. They've done it through the legislative route and they've done it through the administrative route, the regulatory route. So the legislative route, the two major pieces of permanent changes to telehealth policy when a PHG is over happened really with appropriation bills or budget bills. So there was one for 2020 that was passed in 2020 to impact 2021 called the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2020 and then the Budget Act of 2022. Now, the thing is with the Consolidated Appropriation Act, the changes that were made to permanent telehealth policy on the federal level in Medicare did not really address any of the temporary changes that were in effect during COVID-19. It, But it did make some permanent changes to the telehealth policy for Medicare. And what it did was it expanded the ability to use telehealth to deliver mental and behavioral health services without the rule restriction applying and allowing the patient to be in their home if certain caveats were met. Now, that's the important thing to understand there. I think a lot of people thought when they initially read it, they thought, oh great, this is expanding um, mental and behavioral health services where you can use telehealth to provide that underneath the Medicare program. And it did, but it, it required you to meet certain requirements before you can do that. And the big requirement was that you needed to have an in-person visit between the patient and the telehealth provider six months prior to those telehealth services taking place. So I'll repeat that again. In order to avoid having to meet the rural or geographical requirement in providing services via telehealth underneath the Medicare program and to allow the services to take place in the home, and if they were mental and behavioral health services, you, needed to you need to have a visit between the telehealth provider and the patient at least six months prior to those telehealth services beginning. Now, if you were not going to see the patient in their home and you were not going to try to avoid the, the rule requirement underneath the Medicare program where telehealth is concerned and that they were you know, receiving the services in an eligible originating site, such as a hospital or clinic, you did not need to meet. You do not need to meet that 
in-person visit requirement. That is only when you're trying to avoid that geographical limitation or try to provide the services in the home. So just to be clear on that, I know it can be a little bit confusing, but it did expand the ability to use telehealth to provide those mental and behavioral health services, but it did have caveats on there. So the expansion wasn't as great. It was a little bit narrower than maybe what some people were hoping, but it definitely was a change and it definitely was a bit of an expansion than what we had prior to the pandemic underneath our permanent telehealth policies for Medicare. The other legislative act was the Budget Act of 2022. And what this did do was address some of those public health emergency temporary changes for telehealth. But what it said was, we are going to, once the public health emergency is declared over, there's a grace period for some of those temporary telehealth waivers that will still exist for another 151 days after the public health emergency is declared over. So it was not all of the waivers that existed for COVID-19 related telehealth. It was only some of them, some of the major ones, but not all of them. So what we know now is that there's going to be a 151 day grace period after the public health emergency for some of the telehealth temporary policies. Um, and as it stands right now, once that 151 days are over, then those temporary policies also will go away. And those temporary policies were essentially what they declared in the bill was that um, certain providers can continue providing services via telehealth, such as FQHCs, RHCs, and PTs and OTs, and also that um, you can still use audio only during this 151 day grace period, and also uh, the geographic limitation, and you're also be able to provide services in the home. So it was, it was some of the biggest temporary waivers, but it wasn't all of them. You notice I did not say anything about HIPAA, the HIPAA waiver that was at the beginning issued or allowed at the beginning of the pandemic, nor did I talk about prescribing controlled substances. It's because it was not in the bill. It was just some of the temporary policies. The other way in which to uh, uh, have permanent policy or established policy for the Medicare program on the federal level is through what's called the physician fee schedule, which is basically CMS issues um, usually around July of every year for the following year, there are proposals of what changes they're going to make to the Medicare program as far as their policies. They issue their draft proposals in July, people have time to comment on that, and then they issue a final version of it, usually around this time of year, around November, sometimes it's gone as far out as early December, so I expect to see the final version any time now or any day now, and then those final provisions, unless they have like a, a Specific, specific date attached to them, they usually go into effect January 1st. So for the last physician fee schedule, last couple of physician fee schedules, we saw CMS starting to make moves onto like what would be like, what would we see in the future, either like permanent policies for telehealth, or at least like, you know, what was sticking around for maybe a period of time. And what they did was, well, the first one, if it's actually, I'm going to take the third bullet, is that they did say that they're going to keep some of the temporary services that were allowed during the pandemic on the telehealth list to stick around until the end of 2023. Now, not all the services. For those who are not familiar, when COVID-19 started, CMS has a permanent telehealth list. So these are a list of services that you can provide via telehealth that they will reimburse for, and they're permanent. They existed before the pandemic, and um, they're going to exist after the pandemic. Um, but they also had a temporary list, and they said these codes and these services we will reimburse for if it's provided via telehealth during the public health emergency. They carved out an additional um, section of from that temporary list, what they called category three. So it's a subset of those temporary codes, and they said like, well, these codes are going to remain around until the end of 2023. So let's say our our um, PHE is over in January. We have the 151 day grace period. And then we have, um, you know, once that is over, then all the temporary waivers go away. We know at least the services in category three will stick around until the end of 2023. Now, you may ask, but what about services during the 151 day grace period? It's the full list that CMS clarified the full temporary telehealth list will stick around for the 151 day grace period. The other thing that CMS has done around permanent policies, the other major thing, is that they have said that audio only can be used to provide mental and behavioral health services and 
um, the uh, after the pandemic. So what this means is that now telehealth providers can use audio only to provide mental behavioral health services, eligible mental behavioral health services still has to be on that permanent list if certain conditions are met. And then we see the reappearance again of like, oh, if there's one of the conditions is like having that in-person visit with the patient before you provide the services that way. And then there are other conditions as well too. But this is like something that was a major change in like allowing audio only to be used before the pandemic. Nobody probably would have considered allowing that. But recognizing the great need for mental behavioral services and the fact that, um, at least in CMS's eyes, that audio only is an effective way of providing that, they're allowing that. The other thing that they are doing is that they redefine what a mental health visit meant for an FQHC and an RHC. Now, FQHCs and RHCs are not allowed to be distant site providers underneath the Medicare program. They cannot provide services via telehealth. They can be an originating site. They can be the site where the patient is located, but they can't be the telehealth provider. That changed during the pandemic temporarily. And also that's still gonna continue for them during the 151 day grace period. But after that 151 day grace period, unless something has changed in between now and then, FQHCs and RHCs will no longer become eligible providers. So you're asking me like, you know, so what did CMS exactly do? Well, what they did was they redefined what a mental health visit meant for FQHCs and RHCs. And in that definition, they included the ability to use live video and audio only to provide a mental health visit. So keep in mind, this is a redefinition of what a mental health visit means for these entities, FQHCs and RHCs. So that does not mean in CMS's eye in the Medicare program that they become telehealth providers. They are simply using these pieces of technology to provide a mental health service because it fits now underneath the definition of what a mental health service means for these two entities. That also means that they still get their PPS rate or their air rate because it is a mental health visit, they get their usual rate that they would have gotten for a mental health visit. And it also means because they're not regarded as being a telehealth provider, they don't fall underneath or they don't have to meet those telehealth limitations or uh, requirements such as you need to be in a rural area type of requirement. They do have to meet all the other sort of requirements and obligations of what a mental health visit means for their, their organization. But those telehealth specific ones in federal law don't apply to them in this particular case. So this is sort of an overview. And yes, you can get a copy of the slides after this presentation. So don't worry to like trying to like read everything right here. But it shows you sort of where the PHE waivers were, or like major ones, and then what happens in the 150 day uh, grace period, and then what happens post PHE post PhD as far as we know now. So this, this webinar is taking place on October 28th, 2022. If you are viewing this at a later date, keep that in mind because there may be legislation or other policies passed in the meantime that could alter some of this. But this is really what the landscape is going to look like after um, the PhD is declared over. We have our 151 day grace period and what stays in there. And then we have our post PhD period. Now I mentioned earlier that I, that Congress did not talk about for the 151 day grace period, uh, prescribing controlled substances or what happens around HIPAA. There is a OCR, Office of Civil Rights, which oversees HIPAA and where it was the agency that issued the, um, the, the, the guidance at the beginning of COVID that said, we will exercise discretion on like what platforms you use and, and HIPAA and like how that interacts and that works. There's an FAQ that OCR has, and the link is provided in this slide, where they say that basically we revert back to like HIPAA requirements once the PHE is over. So that does not qualify them. So they are not, that guidance is not going to be in effect during that 151 day grace period. Additionally, with prescribing controlled substances using telehealth, the PHE exception that allowed that without having an in-person visit between the telehealth provider and the patient or having the patient fit into one of those narrow exceptions, such as being at a DA registered facility, that will also go away. It's because there was already an exception in federal law that said once a PHE is declared, then we're gonna allow this to happen where they, they can prescribe, a telehealth provider can prescribe, 
without one of the narrow exceptions applying and without an in-person visit with the patient. So once the PhD is over, that exception then goes away. Um, so what's next? So what we're looking at is potential administrative actions. So these are actions that administering agencies can um, take without having to wait for Congress. That's within their powers that what they can do. One thing with like the controlled substance situation is that there's another option. It's called telehealth registry. So the Drug Enforcement Agency has the power to create a telehealth registry where the concept is if you're a provider, you get on that registry, you've been vetted, you're good, you're a good actor and everything, you can just go ahead and prescribe without, again, falling into one of those other narrow exceptions. That has not been created yet. We have not seen any um, any regulations or proposals on like how that would be set up. But that is an option as to, you know, a channel as to like expanding or the use of telehealth to prescribe controlled substances without relying on the public health emergency declaration. Um, I had on here, I said OCR could decide to extend HIPAA discretion through 151 day grace period, but it kind of sounds like that they're not with that FAQ. That was very recent. So, so it sounds like that that's not going to happen. CMS is kind of limited in what they can do. So they've like put out there what they're doing on the regulatory process, at least for 2023. We're going to have to wait and then most likely again to the next physician fee schedule if they're going to make any other changes. But also a lot of those Medicare limitations are in federal law. So that would require Congress to act, which is our next bullet of like what Congress needs to do. You probably are aware there are a lot of bills out there, federal bills related to telehealth, I personally don't think any of them are going to pass. What has happened historically is that elements in those telehealth bills have been plucked out and put into larger bills, such as what we saw earlier with like the budget or appropriation bills. I think that's more likely the case that if they're going to make a permanent telehealth policy change, they'll wrap it up or roll it into a larger bill. So it's important to keep your eye on those larger bills as well, too. And that is it for my section. I'm going to take one or two questions from the Q&A, and then we'll move on to our other speakers, because I know you're anxious to hear from them, too. Um, so from Douglas Chandler, for in-person visit, it has to be at least six months prior to the telehealth sessions. So I have to see the patient in person at least once and then wait six months to start telehealth. No, you don't have to wait six months to start telehealth. You just need to have had seen them at least six months before you start those telehealth sessions. So let's say you saw the patient um, May 1st. Technically, then you can start your, your telehealth sessions May 2nd. So you just need to have had seen them within that six month period. But let's say you saw them seven months ago in person and you want to start telehealth. You need to have like another in-person visit with them as well, too. And then there are other requirements as well, too. Uh, there was a requirement that Hurst made clear that um, you would need to have like an in-person visit every 12 months afterwards, but then they had exceptions to it. But that's like the basics of it is that you need to have an in-person visit with the patient prior to starting those telehealth services if if you are trying to not meet that requirement, that geographic requirement, and you're trying to provide services in the patient's home. And again, this is only for mental and behavioral health services as well, too. Um, I am going to move us on to our next speaker, because again, we have some two great speakers on here. So I really want you guys to have an opportunity to hear from them. We have up first John Gordon, who is a social science research analyst in the New York Regional Office of the Office of Evaluation and Inspections within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General. John's research specialty areas include telehealth and Medicare and Medicaid, Medicare Parts B and C, and behavioral health. He received his master's of public administration in health policy and management from New York University. So I'll turn it over to John now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, May. So hi, everyone. My name is John Gordon. As May said, I'm a research analyst in the Office of Evaluation and Inspections at HHS OIG. I'm excited to be speaking with you today about HHS OIG's telehealth portfolio. For anyone who isn't familiar, we at, oh, sorry, can you go back one slide? Thank you. So for anyone who isn't familiar, we at HHS OIG are tasked with conducting independent and objective audits, investigations, and evaluations with the goal of making healthcare programs more efficient and effective. We work to ensure that programs are helping people as intended and not wasting money. 
Many people think of HHS OIG is solely focused on audits and investigations with a particular emphasis on fraud, waste, and abuse. But my office, the Office of Evaluation and Inspections, conducts research to encourage efficiency, effectiveness, and effectiveness in HHS programs, as well as weeding out fraud, waste, and abuse. Over the past several years, we've built an expansive body of work on telehealth that spans both Medicare and Medicaid. And we're also leading a collaborative project with five other offices of inspectors general that will provide information about telehealth across healthcare programs in six federal agencies. Next slide. As I'm sure you all know, the pandemic created unprecedented challenges for how Medicare beneficiaries access healthcare. In response, Congress, HHS, and CMS took a number of steps to temporarily, temporarily expand access to telehealth for Medicare beneficiaries. With these temporary expansions, for the first time, people with Medicare could receive a wide variety of telehealth services from their homes, regardless of whether they lived in urban or rural areas. They could also receive some telehealth services using audio-only technology. With these changes came a dramatic increase in the use of telehealth, and questions about what safeguards are needed to protect Medicare from fraud, waste, and abuse related to telehealth. We knew that it was essential that CMS and the department should have more information about all these issues and how telehealth impacted them, especially as they began making decisions about the future of telehealth. So we set out to design a body of work that addressed four key questions. One, how was telehealth used during the pandemic? two, who provided telehealth services, three, who used telehealth, and finally, what additional safeguards are needed to protect the program and beneficiaries against fraud, waste, and abuse related to telehealth. Next slide. The first study provides stakeholders with a broad 30,000 foot view of what telehealth utilization looked like early in the pandemic. Overall, we found that more than 28 million beneficiaries or just over two in five, used a telehealth service during the first year of the pandemic. Additionally, Medicare beneficiaries used 88 times more telehealth services during the first year of the pandemic than they did in the prior year. When looking at the use of telehealth more closely during the first year of the pandemic, we found that telehealth use peaked in April 2020 and then slightly declined through early 2021. Next slide, please. When it comes to the types of services that beneficiaries used via telehealth, they most commonly used telehealth for office visits, such as an appointment with a primary care provider or specialist, usually for the evaluation or management of a patient's health. Yet, when looking more closely at the data, it was their use of telehealth for behavioral health services that stood out. And that's because beneficiaries used telehealth for a much larger share of their behavioral health services compared to their use of telehealth for other services. As you can see in the bar chart here, we found that beneficiaries use telehealth for 43% of all behavioral health services they received. In contrast, they use telehealth for only 13% of all office visits. Next slide, please. The second study looked at the relationship between providers and beneficiaries who use telehealth services, or more specifically, whether or not beneficiaries were receiving telehealth services from providers they'd seen before. Notably, we found that 84% of beneficiaries received all of their telehealth services from providers with whom they had an established relationship, meaning the patients had in-person visits with the provider before receiving telehealth. Further, these beneficiaries had an in-person visit with their provider an average of four months prior to their first telehealth service. Next slide, please. The third study provides stakeholders with more granular insight into those who may have particularly benefited from expanded telehealth policies, as well as those who may continue to face barriers to telehealth uptake. I also wanted to briefly plug here that two weeks ago, we released a Spanish translation of this report on our public website to increase access to this important work. Looking to the findings of this report, we found that those in urban areas who largely did not have access to telehealth prior to the pandemic were more likely than those in rural areas to use telehealth during the first year of the pandemic. In addition, 93% of beneficiaries who used telehealth did so from home or a non-healthcare setting across both urban and rural areas. Previously, beneficiaries had to travel to an approved originating site, such as a doctor's office or hospital, to receive telehealth services from a practitioner at a distant site. 
As for the types of beneficiaries who are most likely to use telehealth and Medicare, we found that duly eligible benef beneficiaries, Hispanic beneficiaries, younger beneficiaries, and female beneficiaries were more likely than others to use telehealth, regardless of each group's likelihood of using any healthcare service overall. This was particularly notable for Hispanic beneficiaries, as we found that they were less likely to use any service overall, whether that was via telehealth or in person. This could suggest that Hispanic beneficiaries particularly benefited from the temporary expansion of telehealth policies. Next slide, please. We also looked at beneficiaries' use of certain types of audio-only telehealth services. We found that 19%, or about one in five Medicare beneficiaries, used one of these audio-only telehealth services during the first year of the pandemic. Importantly, we found that 93% of beneficiaries who used one of these audio-only services did so exclusively. In other words, these beneficiaries did not use any audio-video telehealth services during the first year of the pandemic. Looking at the characteristics of those most likely to use these audio-only services, we found that older beneficiaries were more likely to use them than younger beneficiaries. This was particularly notable as older beneficiaries were less likely to use all telehealth services, including audio-video telehealth, than younger beneficiaries. This could suggest that older beneficiaries, beneficiaries either have a preference for audio-only telehealth services or may face barriers to using audio-video telehealth services. Next slide, please. Given our findings, we had four critical recommendations to CMS. First, CMS should take appropriate steps to enable a successful transition from current pandemic-related flexibilities to well-considered long-term policies for the use of telehealth for beneficiaries in urban areas and from the beneficiaries' home. This is critical, as once the public health emergency and 151-day extension end, many of these temporary expansions will end. And that will mean that millions of Medicare beneficiaries who have come to rely on telehealth, including those in urban areas and those in both rural and urban areas using telehealth from home, will no longer be able to do so for most types of telehealth services. Second, CMS should temporarily extend the use of audio-only telehealth services and evaluate their impact. As I just mentioned, our findings showed that these services could be particularly beneficial for certain groups of beneficiaries, such as older beneficiaries. However, there are appropriate concerns about expanded use of audio-only services, such as their impact on quality of care, which need to be considered. Therefore, we think temporary extension to allow further evaluation would be prudent. Third, CMS should require a modifier to identify all audio-only tele services provided in Medicare. This would allow researchers and oversight agencies the ability to better understand and monitor audio-only tele services going forward. Finally, CMS should use telehealth to advance healthcare equity. Next slide, please. I don't know if it's frozen on my end or frozen on your guys' end. Can you guys see? There we go. Thank you. So our last study, which is also released, la released last month, provides stakeholders with insight into certain billing practices that providers may be using to bill for telehealth services in a manner that poses a high risk to the Medicare program. Using firsthand knowledge from the field, along with analyses of the claims data, we developed seven measures to identify high-risk billing practices that may indicate fraud, waste, or abuse. For each measure, we set thresholds at extreme levels much higher than the, than the thresholds based on a standard technique to identify outliers known as the Tukey method. And because this report focuses on specific measures with very high thresholds, it does not capture all concerning billing related to telehealth services that may be occurring in Medicare. Next slide. Using the seven measures, we identified about 1,700 providers whose billing for telehealth services poses a high risk to Medicare of approximately 742,000 providers who billed for a telehealth service during the first year of the pandemic. Together, these providers billed for telehealth services for about half a million beneficiaries, and they received a total of about 128 million in Medicare fee-for-service payments. In addition, 
Many of these providers are part of the same medical practice as at least one other provider whose billing poses a high risk. This may indicate that certain practices are encouraging such billing among their associated providers. We also found that 41 of these providers appear to be associated with telehealth companies. However, there is currently no systematic way to identify these companies in the Medicare data. Next slide, please. Looking more closely at the providers flagged by our program integrity measures. First, we found that more than 670 providers billed inappropriately for both a telehealth service and a facility fee for most of their visits. A provider should not bill for both the facility fee and a telehealth service for the same visit, as this would mean that both the provider and beneficiary were at the same physical location when the service was provided. Therefore, the provider is not allowed to deliver a telehealth service. Next, we identified more than 360 providers who always build telehealth services at the highest, most expensive level. This raises concern as it may indicate that the provider is billing for services that were not needed or not provided. In another measure, we identified more than 320 providers who billed for telehealth services for more than 300 days of the year. This may indicate that the provider may not be providing the services for which they are billing. In another measure, we identified more than 130 providers who repeatedly billed Medicare fee-for-service and a Medicare Advantage plan for the same telehealth service. Now, repeated, repeatedly billing both Medicare programs for the same service may indicate that providers are intentionally submitting duplicate claims to increase their Medicare payments. Finally, we found that more than 60 providers commonly billed for telehealth services and then ordered medical equipment and supplies. Next slide, please. Accordingly, we made five recommendations to CMS. First, CMS should strengthen monitoring and targeted oversight of telehealth services. Second, CMS should also provide additional education to providers on appropriate billing for telehealth services. A third recommendation is related to a billing practice known as incident two billing. It is critical for program integrity efforts to identify the individual who delivered the telehealth service that is billed to Medicare. However, this identification is not possible under Medicare's current incident two billing rules. Therefore, we recommend that CMS should also improve the transparency of incident two services when clinical staff primarily delivered the telehealth service. Fourth, CMS should also identify telehealth companies that bill Medicare. There's currently no systematic way to identify these companies in the Medicare data. To improve oversight of telehealth services, it is important that CMS and other oversight agencies be able to identify providers associated with telehealth companies on claims and encounters. Finally, CMS should follow up on the providers identified in this report. Next slide, please. Sorry about the queue back one more. Thank you. So looking forward, we have other evaluations and audits focused on telehealth in the works. As I mentioned earlier, in collaboration with the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, otherwise known as the PRAC, we're working on a report with five other OIGs, including the Departments of Defense, Labor, Justice, Veterans Affairs, and the Office of Personnel Management, looking at the use of telehealth and related program integrity risks across selected federal healthcare programs during the first year of the pandemic. This report should be released in the coming months, so keep an eye out for that. Um, additionally, our Office of Audit Services is conducting audits of telehealth, including Medicare Part B services and home health services, among other areas, and those should be coming out in the not-too-distant future. Uh, we're keeping our finger on the pulse of the ever-evolving telehealth landscape, so telehealth will continue to be a part of the HHS OIG portfolio. If you'd like to stay updated with our telehealth work, keep an eye on our telehealth featured topics page on our public website, which lists our work plan and other telehealth related updates. Next slide. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for your time and attention and I'll open up for any questions y'all may have.
Thank you, John. And my apologies, my computer froze at two points. So sorry for the delay in advancing slides and then advancing a little bit too far. Um, I am so glad that you were able to, to do this because I'm not quite sure everybody was familiar with the OIG's role in like the entire federal landscape here. So thank you for providing that overview and thank you for providing us with some um, work that OIG has been doing around telehealth. Really quickly around the fraud uh, report though. Now that's, the report did not find evidence of fraud. It was things that triggered, that was were a flag for potential fraud that needs to be investigated further. But these were sort of like the hallmarks of, of what you're looking at that is sort of like raising a flag of like, this needs a closer look. Am I right in that? Yes, you are right. That's an important distinction. So we're looking at indicators of what we're calling high risk billing for telehealth services. So any determination of fraud or an overpayment would require additional invest investigation. Okay, um, we have a question from Stephanie and I'm gonna apologize ahead of time if I mangle anybody's name. Mon Moncada, Kada, um, a question for John, what are the age cut points? What is an older beneficiary in terms of age? Yes, that's, that's an important distinction. So I think in this instance, older beneficiaries were those 75 and older, um, and that was comparing their use of telehealth to those younger than 74 or younger. All right, well, thank you, John. If you could just stick around for when we bring everybody back, I wanna move us on to our next speaker here. Our next speaker, I am just about to share my screen, hold up, give me one second here, is Carly Patterson. Carly is an Associate Director in the Healthcare and Delivery um, delivery and Disparities Program at the uh, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. In this role, she manages a portfolio of healthcare delivery and disparities research studies and contributes to the Corey's research initiatives focused on telehealth, healthy aging, caregiving, chronic conditions, and rare diseases. So I will turn it over now to Carly. Great. Thanks so much, May, and thanks uh, for having us here to, to give everyone a little bit of information about the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute and the work that we do. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll start with a little bit about PCORI, just so that we're all on the same page. If you could go to the next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of PCORI's authorizing law, but the Institute exists to generate research evidence to help inform patients, policymakers, and other stakeholders around um, making informed health decisions. So we're a research funder with the goal of generating evidence that can be used uh, in policymaking and other decisions. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about our institute. We are an independent research institute. We were authorized by Congress first in 2010 and then reauthorized for 10 more years in 2019. Our institute is governed by a 21 member board of governors and we fund specifically comparative clinical effectiveness research. Uh, the research that we fund must engage patients and other stakeholders throughout the research process to ensure that the work being done is going to produce meaningful findings, and seeks to answer real-world questions about what works best for patients based on their circumstances. Next slide, please. So with our reauthorization comes a new set of national priorities for health for PCORI so that you can see some of you know, where we focus our funding. So uh, at the center here is patient-centered health, and we have five uh, national priorities enhancing infrastructure, advancing the science of dissemination and implementation, achieving health equity, progress towards an integrated health system, and increasing the evidence for existing interventions and emerging innovations in health are all um, parts of our strategic plan moving forward. Next slide, please. And the way that PCORI accomplishes the work that we do, we talked um, a little bit just now about the uh, Comparative Effectiveness Research, or CER, but there are also several other elements to the work that PCORI does, and those include dissemination and implementation, infrastructure, and engagement. So all of these components come together uh, to accomplish PCORI's strategic plan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So we're going to talk a little bit about the telehealth portfolio. Uh, as you can see, I didn't mention a particular disease or condition. So PCORI funds across all um, health conditions and across the, the spectrum of diagnosis, treatment, prevention, um, and management of disease. So for our telehealth portfolio, we can go to the next slide, please. Since 2010, PCORI has made a substantial investment uh, in research studies generating evidence on uh, telehealth, telemedicine, and mHealth. And so to the tune of $600 million across 123 comparative clinical effectiveness research studies. Uh, and you can see here, we break this out by telehealth. There's 108 projects that address modalities um, for telehealth, 75 for mHealth, and then 44 for telemedicine, with some uh, having a combination of um, two or more. So they may be classified as more than one type. Next slide, please. And our telehealth studies do target vulnerable populations. So a subset of those, um, of that over 120 um, studies is uh, 61 of those studies do use telehealth to address disparities. And you can see here just the populations of interest. Uh, there were several studies that focus on racial and ethnic minorities, low income individuals, uh, rural persons with disabilities, low health, literacy, and numeracy, and also the LGBT community. Next slide, please. And so we're just gonna go through uh, just a couple of study highlights from the PCORI telehealth portfolio, um, but I would, this is just a few examples. So I would encourage anyone who's interested um, in a particular condition or topical area, we have a very robust search engine on our website where you can see all of the research results um, for studies that have them available uh, available on PCORI's website. But let's go ahead and just give you a couple examples. Next slide, please. So this first study was one addressing childhood hearing loss disparities in an Alaska Native population. And the objective was to compare effectiveness of two school-based screening and then referral processes in rural Alaska. And these utilized um, a standard referral process. So everyone was screened in school and either received the standard referral process or they received um, uh, a telemedicine visit with an audiologist for those who screened positive. And you can see here that the uh, engagement involvement included those from the village communities, parents, patient partners, educators, as well as the clinicians, the audiologists and surgeons, all as part of the research team. And the impact here was that this study demonstrated telemedicine can reduce a key rural health disparity in access to care, because after nine months, students that were using the process that um, used a telemedicine visit with an audiologist were more likely to get a diagnosis and to get it faster than students using the standard process of referral. Next slide, please. And so this is an example in adults. This is comparing online care with in-person care for patients who had psoriasis, so um, focused on dermatology. And this evaluated uh, the online specialty care delivery model compared to in-person care for individuals with psoriasis. And this was an equi equivalency trial. So they, researchers uh, intended to determine whether or not this online version was equivalent to the in-person care for severity of chronic skin disease, depression, quality of life, and access to care. And the findings from this study were that the, um, <clears throat> the online specialty care delivery was equivalent for uh, chronic skin disease, so psoriasis severity, as well as depression and quality of life outcomes, as well as, um, of course, those who were doing the online version had less mileage, uh, traveled for care, and also spent less time seeking in-person visits. So this provides a scalable model that could improve patient access, in this case, to dermatology care, while delivering similar clinical outcomes. And April Armstrong was the investigator for this study. Next slide, please. And briefly, because these studies take three to five years typically to complete, those two examples are from prior to the pan that were funded prior to the pandemic, but PCORI has also invested um, a significant amount of targeted funding into studies since the pandemic began. And this is an example of one 
the PCORI funded where we anticipate the findings coming soon. Uh, but this is evaluating uh, comparative effectiveness of telemedicine in primary care. And what this study team is doing is deeply characterizing uh, the telemedicine programs that were implemented in primary care during COVID-19 across over 100 primary care practices, and then comparing the effectiveness of three um, different delivery models in co under COVID-19. So synchronous telemedicine, telemedicine that was supplemented with in-person visits, and primarily in-person visits. And uh, this is among adult patients with one or more of five chronic conditions that are receiving care at these primary care practices. So we're certainly looking forward to the results of this study, which we anticipate early 2023, because um, it could provide really important information about what effective implementation of telemedicine in primary care looks like for managing chronic disease, and particularly among vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. And so PCORI funds comparative clinical effectiveness research, but PCORI also has several other evidence products that we support and fund. And uh, listed here are several of those. So I'm gonna focus on the rapid reviews, which are the second, third, and fourth uh, on this list. But the uh, rapid reviews are a review of the existing literature uh, on any given topic. And PCORI has conducted one on video teleconferencing for disease prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, as well as another on telehealth strategies for the delivery of maternal health care. Um, and in both of those cases, uh, just really highest level. In instances where um, the telehealth visits were used to either supplement or replace in-person care, they were generally found to be um, as effective and in some cases uh, favorable to in-person care. And then we are also very excited about um, rapid reviews that we have underway right now, looking at audio-only care, one for the management of chronic conditions and the other for um, mental health. And we anticipate those will be complete with findings uh, early in 2023. So we'll have to stay tuned for those. Um, and I think that that is all I wanted to, to share with you all today. There's a lot more I could. My contact information is here. And I would welcome anyone to visit our website or, or get in touch with me for more information. Thank you. Carly, thank you so much. Just a couple of quick questions for sure. you. Um, one of them is that uh, you you were refunded for an additional 10 years, literally right before the pandemic. So that was like very good, fortunate timing there. But has the pandemic sort of changed like the trajectory of like how Corey was approaching telehealth and like what they wanted to study? Because you were doing that before the pandemic as well, yeah. too. But did the pandemic sort of shift your thinking on what you needed to focus in on? Yeah, so I think just, yes, because telehealth has become such a, um, such a huge question or, you know, there's been just the pandemic ultimately meant that we needed a lot more evidence in telehealth and in areas that we don't have it already necessarily like audio only and others. Um, and I think it it also dovetails nicely with our focus on equity, which PCORI has also always had a focus on addressing disparities is, is what's highlighted in the telehealth portfolio. But I think that's only been enhanced now. And so we uh, invite a lot of investigator initiated research. And so we're seeing a lot more investment in telehealth just by nature of the changing landscape in the healthcare system. So there's going to be a lot more work that's ultimately going to be funded by PCORI and has been funded by PCORI since the pandemic that focuses on generating telehealth evidence. Mm -hmm. There's a question in here from Marcelo Tortoriello. Again, I apologize if I am messing up anybody's name, asking about the impact of telehealth in children and particularly in Hispanic children. Has there been like a study that PCORI has done particularly focused on like the Hispanic community or population? Yeah, so th I think there's been, there are several examples of, of studies in PCORI's portfolio that focus on telehealth and care delivery for um, Hispanic individuals. We have some examples in our portfolio. And again, I would highly recommend just taking a look. We have a search engine available and you can plug in your interests because PCORI's funded hundreds and hundreds of studies. Um, but we definitely have a focus and have funded some work on 
um, paraprofessional support for individuals with limited English proficiency and other um, uh, support personnel uh, engaging with those telehealth visits to help make them successful, for example. So there are some examples um, like that. And finally, how do you get your information to, to Congress? Do you have so many studies? Do you do like an annual report or like a report every couple of years? How does that work exactly? So typically we have uh, done briefings. So we our most recent briefing was in 2020 that was focused on telehealth and COVID-19. Uh, and we are planning to do more of those in the spring as well. So it's typically through um, these briefings or, or opportunities to share some PCORI evidence in different areas. Okay, great. I'm going to bring John back so we can take a couple more questions. We are rapidly running out of time. I apologize for that. But we've just had like such great speakers here. So we're not going to be able to get to everybody's question, but we'll try to get to a couple more before we end. Um, one question, actually, I think this is for you, John. Are you finding any issues where providers are marking services as telehealth that are in-person type of services? Was that one of the flags, I think, that they're asking about? Yeah, so that, that was not one of the flags that we'd included in our program integrity report. Um, and that's that's not something that's been within the scope of any of the studies that we've been working on recently. Okay. Um, I am trying to consolidate a couple of questions here together. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure, Renee Pennington, there is an ongoing PHG related to opioid use Oh, to opioid use disorder. Yes. Yeah, so for those who aren't familiar, we're actually underneath two public health emergency, one for the opioid use disorder and one for COVID. Does the PHG cover the prescribing of all controlled substances or only TX for OUD? So I think the question is, is the um, PHE allowing telehealth to be used to prescribe controlled substances, is that connected to the COVID one or is it connected to the opioid use disorder one? And my understanding is that it is only connected to the COVID one, not the opioid use disorder. So that did not kick in for the opioid use disorder. It was only enacted or went into effect for the um, COVID PHG on that one. Uh, let's see what else is in here. Do, do you know of a group that's advocating for activating the telehealth registry so controlled substances can be prescribed via telehealth? A little bit of background about that. So the DEA registry that I'm talking about for telehealth, there was actually in a, there was actually a directive from Congress back in 2019 for them to actually promulgate regulations for the DEA registry. By the end of 2019, they hadn't done it. And then COVID hit, and I think everybody became preoccupied with COVID. It's still there. I personally don't know where DEA was or is on like where they are with their regulations. I, 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 I doubt Carly, you or John have any insight in that. Although if you do, please feel free to speak up. Um, I was not able to secure a DEA speaker because if I was, that would have been a question that we all had. So I don't know where it is right now. I do know that back in 2019, they, they were asked by Congress to have at least uh, finalized regulations for the registry, but but they didn't. And then COVID happened like a month or two later. So I think everybody's just been dealing with the pandemic. So we are at time. I'm going to apologize first to all our attendees. I know there are a lot more questions in here. CCHP will download those and we'll try to answer and get back to people as, uh, as much as we can. But first off, I want to thank John and Carly. You guys were terrific. Thank you so much for doing this. I think it was very good that folks were able to hear from you, hear about the research and the great work that Corey has been doing. And also, John, the important work OIG does and really, you know, the impact that you have on these policies going forward, your recommendations stations to CMS, for example. So thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedules to do this. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things before I close everything out here. Let me just get us back to our slides. I guess the slides will be made available and a recording of the webinar will be made available a couple of days afterwards. So check next week and we should have this up on our website and our YouTube page and cchpca.org. Um, 
So thank you again to John Gordon um, with the Office of Inspector General, to Carly Patterson with PCORI. You guys were terrific. If you are interested in keeping track of telehealth policy news and information, you can subscribe to CCHP's newsletter. Also, when you log out today, you will receive an evaluation form. If you can fill that out, that would really help us out a lot too. I wanna thank again our speakers. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope everyone has a great day. Stay safe and have a terrific weekend. Bye.